Welcome to the virtual open house for our online Master of Science in Applied IT. Um, my name is Heather Bryant. I am an admissions representative here at George Mason University, um, and I work with the graduate programs online. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes, um, but as more folks are coming in, if you could just put a message in the chat um, letting me know what your first name is and where you're coming in from, just so that I know that you can hear me and see me, and we'll get started in just a moment. Hey, welcome everybody. We're going to get started in just a moment. Um, if you could just put a message in the chat letting me know your first name and where you're joining from so that I know that you can hear me and see me. Hey, okay, great. All right, so we have one person from Florida. Awesome. Okay, some folks from Virginia locally. Nice to see everybody in here. Okay. All right, we'll give it a, another minute or two and then we'll get started. Um, again, my name is Heather Bryant. I'm an admissions representative here at George Mason. We're just giving folks a few minutes to join and then we'll get started. If you're just joining us now, just put your first name and your where you're joining from in the chat so I know that you can hear me and see me as we get started here. Give it about one more minute and then we'll get started. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you for joining us for the virtual open house for our online Master of Science in Applied IT. My name is Heather Bryant. I am an admissions representative for our online programs here at George Mason. Um, and I'm very happy you could join us this evening. Um, so I'm here as a resource to give information, answer questions and walk you through the admissions process if you decide to move forward with an application. Um, this event is set up so that we will answer questions at the end, but um, our faculty member who is here tonight, Dr. Rudakova, also said that if you would like to raise your hand and ask questions while she's talking, that's fine as well. Um, so please feel free to um, use the raise hand feature to ask questions or just type them in the chat and I'll read them afterwards. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started now. Um, so our agenda for this evening. So first, um, we'll meet our presenter, Dr. Rutikova. Um, she'll talk a little bit about the program details, um, the career outlook, as, also, as well as some details about the curriculum in this program. Um, she'll also explain the online classroom and how that works. And then we'll talk a little bit about admissions requirements and next steps. And then um, I'll pose questions that are offered up in the chat and we can um, do a little bit of a Q&A as well. So that's our, our agenda for this evening. And then um, these are just the instructions for the chat. Um, so in your controls in the bottom window, you can click chat for the chat window to appear and type your message. And you can also select who you would like to send the message to by clicking next to. Um, you can just select everyone you, or um, you can select me if you'd like. Um, also, if you have a question during the presentation, um, you can use the raise hand feature as well. Um, and then um, you may need to unmute yourself to ask your question. Um, but those are the instructions for how to ask questions this evening. Okay, so um, with that, I'm going to introduce our presenter, Dr. Rita Kova, um, who will talk a little bit about herself, her role in the program, and then um, talk to you more about the program. Well, thank you very much, Heather. Uh, my name is Dr. Rita Kova. It's very exciting to be here and to meet uh, students. Um, what I really like to do when I give a presentation is to um, have some sort of um, well, um, a conversation with students. Um, I, I'm, I'm heavily involved in research on um, in learning analytics, uh, though my, my background is in data sciences and uh, big data analytics, but I do a lot of research in cognitive and learning sciences. Uh, and uh, if you look at what research says, that uh, they say that people 
uh, lose their attention uh, and interest in, uh, I don't know, two, four minutes, maybe 10 minutes at most. And that's what I'm always uh, worried about. When I give a presentation, I don't see students, I don't see people at all. I don't know what's going on, if they're still with me, if they're paying attention, if they want to ask a question. Um, if you would like to say something, you don't really have to wait until the end of this presentation. We have um, uh, we have a relatively small group of students, I, and I really want to make it a more personalized presentation than a generic presentation. It would be really nice if you put some questions in the chat window, if you cannot speak, if you can speak, it would be even better. So please feel free to interrupt me at any moment. Um, I can adjust my presentation to what you want to hear. I you know, have the slides, but in general, there is so much I can talk talk, talk about. And I, I'm truly excited to present our program. It's a great program. Um, I am proud to say that we developed it uh, well about 10 years ago, but we consistently improve this program. We work on that. Uh, and we spend so much time on, on, on improving this program. So um, I am um, I'm happy to present a highly a high quality program. I'm happy to discuss anything you want to know about this program. And I just need to see your question. So please don't hesitate to stop me at any time and ask specific questions. Um, you probably see my background. I spent in academia all my life. Uh, I'm the kind of, I'm, my, my grandfather was a professor, my mom was a professor, uh, I am in the, in the family of professors, and I didn't really have much of a choice when I, when it was about my future career, then I, I knew from the very beginning that I will end up in academia, and I'm very happy because I ended up at Mason, not just in some other institution, but I've been at Mason for many years, over 15 years, um, I've done I've done a lot of interesting projects here. I participated in developing multiple programs, undergraduate, graduate, multiple uh, new uh, research projects. Um, and uh, uh, with with all of my my knowledge that I have and experience, uh, uh, I worked closely with my colleagues, with industry leaders to develop uh, this program, MSAIT. About ten years ago, we developed this program uh, in response to the needs of government agencies. They approached us and said if we could create a new program, graduate program, because we very successfully gave a few uh, workshops and courses, individual courses to their employees uh, in the field of big data and cybersecurity. And back then, it was over 10 years ago, uh, it was quite uh, revolutionary. Not that many departments were uh, ready to do so, but we had, uh, again, our contacts with uh, industry and, and uh, government agencies. Um, and we, we did a great job on that. We developed this program. About five years ago, this program was redesigned significantly. Um, obviously, the IT field changes quite quite, quite a lot. Well, uh, everything we teach today will be different tomorrow. Well, it's maybe a slight exaggeration, but still, that's what uh, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep up with industry, with the recent... Yes, yeah, we can go actually to the next slide, yes. So, thank you. Uh, that, and there is a great summary here about the MSAIT program. But the idea is that we are a very, very dynamic department. Uh, we are probably the largest department in the university, or at least one of the largest. We have over 2,000 students, um, but the, at the graduate level, it's about uh, 250 students uh, in, in all, all together. We have two graduate programs that we, we, we offer to our students. But what's important is that uh, in MSAIT, particularly the program that I'm here to present, we have the, the most interesting topics and concentrations that we cover, uh, topics that we cover in this program. We focus on cybersecurity, data science, machine learning, and natural language processing, um, intelligence methods, human computer interaction. You will see some of these core courses in this program, but there are three major areas where we, we offer students is three major concentrations. Um, and the first one is cybersecurity, which is quite successful because our cybersecurity online program was uh, uh, was ranked in the top twenty five programs in the past um, uh, in the last few years. Then we offer a concentration in machine learning engineering. Uh, uh, and uh, or we also offer a, a concentration in big data intelligence methods. So again, you will get a, a, a mix of different courses, but the idea for each concentration is that we build foundation and then we allow students to choose a concentration and then uh, specialize in that concentration. 
Next slide, please. Um, it's not just about the university, George Mason, uh, that the, the place, the university itself is uh, quite, quite impressive. It's a great school. It's a public university. Uh, it's also, it's an R1 university, which means that we are very strong in research. We are, again, one of the largest uh, universities, uh, well, in Virginia, I guess, maybe even in the country, we're quite large, maybe not the largest, but we are quite large. Um, uh, and uh, we are also at the institutional level, we are very dynamic, we respond quickly to the needs of industry, to the needs of um, our students, current and prospective students, we listen to that, we collect data, and we try to develop, uh, uh, again, the top courses that are available today. I am particularly proud about, we have again multiple programs, but I'm particularly proud of this, this program, because our uh, courses were developed professionally, um, uh, it's not, well, actually, let me take it back for just a second before I get to the courses. I wanted, I forgot to mention that, uh, well, due to pandemic, everyone went online. And uh, now if you say people, can you teach online? Uh, everybody says, sure, we can do that. Well, that's what happened in the last few years. But our department, we are experts in online education because we were the first department in the university uh, that developed the entire program online about 10 years ago. And there is a significant difference between, uh, well, teaching online in a year or two and developing courses consistently, online courses for 10 years. As the director for, uh, for online education in our, uh, in our college, he says, Professor Garrison, he says that not only we developed the first program, but more importantly, we uh, developed best practices, procedures, uh, standards for online education that are now adopted by other departments and other colleges with a Mason. So we are experts on that. We don't just, uh, that's a very common question that I receive from students. They say, so you have a, an online course and uh, what do you do there? If we have time, usually we don't have much time. It's only one hour, but I try to finish it with maybe 30 to 40 minutes so that we have time for questions. But if anybody's interested, I will be happy to stay longer and show you an actual course, um, how it looks. Uh, the course looks, again, very professionally. Uh, it's, uh, it's fully online. That's important because many students also ask if there are any activities that require their presence on campus, and the answer is no. Uh, we provide everything to the students online. It includes assignments, meetings, working with other students, taking exams or completing projects that's very well set up in each course, no problem for that. Um, yeah, well, uh, nevertheless, even though it feels like it's the online environment and then students can can take and it's students can take complete all the assignments uh, uh, when they have time, but we do have deadlines for assignments. We make sure that we provide great support for the students. Uh, not only from the academic perspective, we have advisors who guide students through the through their career, uh, college career. That's very important. And our advisors are just outstanding. They have lots of experience. They've been working with graduate students for, for many years. Uh, uh, and you can expect a response in literally less than 24 hours if you contact them. They are experts on any questions regarding which courses to take, which classes to complete first, and so forth. You can also contact, obviously, all the instructors and all the faculty who will be happy to discuss any course with you, your future career, or answer specific questions about any of the areas that we're covering in our, in our curriculum. Well, um, we can go back to online courses that we offer. It is true that it is a media rich collaborative learning environment because what we try to do is we, we develop professional videos. Again, it's not there, there's a difference between the video which somebody takes in the basement and then a professional developed video with a media team. So we were very lucky because we were supported, greatly supported in our development. And uh, our courses are very consistent throughout the entire program. Uh, you will not be surprised every time when you start a new course, you will say, oh, wait a second, I already saw this before. I saw these colors, I saw this design. I know how to find assignments or reading materials or anything else, which, which many students comment on that because they say it's so convenient. I don't have to spend any extra time on, on searching for the course, trying to find what's, what's needed. 
but uh, but it's very consistent throughout, consistent throughout the program. We uh, we use lots of videos. We provide PowerPoint presentations. We include open educational resources so that students could uh, could get the best what's available out there in the world. Uh, and we also include different, very different types of assignments. Um, the goal, I don't know if you know this or not, but what I also hear quite often from students who just, just start this program, they say, oh, you know that it's so different from undergraduate classes because at the graduate level, expectations are, are slightly different. Uh, we want students uh, not just to complete some assignments. That's not the main purpose. We want students to think critically, to, to learn how to solve problems, will really world problems. We want them to know how to apply knowledge that they have, because that's the number one priority for us. We are very closely related to industry and what's going on in industry, uh, in all in the IT industry, uh, because we want our curriculum to reflect uh, the newest technologies that appear on the market. Um, I am very happy to say that we offer new courses every semester, not even every year, but every semester, which is quite impressive. Uh, and students have a luxury of taking uh, new courses um, uh, just on just the the the, the, the most uh, the newest the, the newest uh, on on newest subjects and. Uh, uh, and, uh, and topics that are available in IT, which is to me quite exciting. Um, well, uh, so again, our courses are available online uh, sometimes, but uh, what that's what I wanted to mention. Nevertheless, we make sure that students stay, stay connected and they stay engaged in their classes. We do have all professors, so they have office hours every week. We have teaching assistants or GTAs, graduate teaching assistants, they also offer uh, office hours online, both it's obviously online, uh, every week. Uh, students uh, contact instructors anytime they need, and we ask professors to respond within 24 to 40 hours at most. If it's a weekend or something, then it might be a bit longer, but usually that's within 24 hours. Uh, we incorporate a lot of uh, discussion boards and other platforms within, within our uh, learning management system where we ask students to participate, to ask questions, to post questions, to respond to other students' uh, questions, or uh, and also to work together on some solutions. That's something that uh, in our days, that's it's quite important because we're preparing students to work in, in industry. And uh, we, in our department, we do a lot of research on, um, on um, innovative teaching and learning. We have multiple faculty in our department who receive the highest um, teaching award available in our institution. That's a Mason Outstanding Teaching Award. Um, and these faculty, they are not experts in their fields, like, like whatever, well, any field, that the IT field that we're working in, but they're also experts in education and courses. When they, when they, when they teach these courses, that makes such a difference for students. Students stay, stay motivated, they stay engaged, and they also learn a lot in our courses. The workload is, uh, so for this program, students are required to complete 10 courses, um, maybe we can move on to the next slide. Um, yes, uh, that's already okay. We can look at numbers. Numbers look good, so we can keep it here. But uh, if I go back for just a second about the program itself, so um, the the program has ten courses. We have four fundamental courses, and then um, yeah, that's yeah. Thank you very much. We'll get the numbers to the prices. Uh, maybe we need to switch to other slides. Um, okay. uh, so we have fundamental core courses for all students, they're the same, and they truly build fundamentals in IT. Uh, and then after that, you can move on to concentration courses, even though sometimes students take, uh, take one or two core courses first, and then they start taking some concentration courses, that's also possible. If you look through the list of courses, you will see that we have a large variety of courses and they all cover very interesting topics in each concentration. We have, for instance, on the left side, cybersecurity. It's not just fundamentals, but also we have cloud computing security. Uh, we have network and system security. On the right side, machine learning, for instance, we have introduction to NLP. We also have uh, advanced machine learning courses. Um, and uh, uh, if you if you look at the entire curriculum that we have, that is quite comprehensive and covers prepare students very well for for their future career. 
Uh, what we uh, recommend students to do is to start with core courses and then complete, uh, complete um, advanced courses because some of the advanced courses, they have prerequisites and most of them, they are core courses for, uh, for concentrations. Um, uh, well, if we go back to the previous slide, um, and after graduation, our students have a, they have such a large variety of options where they can go. I also, also often get this question, so what, what can I do with your, with your uh, degree? What I like about this degree, that it's very flexible. If you look at the titles, uh, numbers again are very, very impressive, but if you look at the titles, it could be in cybersecurity, it could be data analytics, machine learning, but what's important today, if you look at the list, and I, I, I've done this because I was um, I once worked on a research project, um, and we analyzed uh, the current state of the jobs, the job market, and how it affects uh, our, our curriculum and students. And, and uh, uh, if you look at the current list of jobs, you will see that um, job titles are very, very, very different. It's not. This is just a short list of some possible options. For, but, but for each one, you can get about 10 different titles that are within the same realm. Um, that's why I recommend students when they look for, uh, for jobs, I recommend to find the, find the title maybe, but focus more on a description for each title. If you look at the description, compare it with the courses that we offer, you will see that the amount of jobs, number of jobs available for what we have to, to offer is, is quite significant. We are preparing students very well for, for what's needed on the market today. You probably know that projections for the, uh, I, I just finished another research project, project and uh, it was about uh, the future career of, of graduates and uh, the World um, Economic Forum reports, which is very, quite famous, um, uh, which was released only one month ago. So it's the, the most, the fresh, very fresh data. And they projected for the next five years, the top areas where jobs will grow will be a number one, big data and data analytics, number two, AI and machine learning. We, both of them, we offered that. Then cybersecurity, and then after that, some other IT fields. So we cover what's the, the areas that are number one priorities right now and uh, lots of jobs that we offer for students. Um, next slide, please. And maybe one more. Here we go. So this is that's you cannot really see that it's just a picture, but that's how a course looks like. That's the start of any course. Uh, we have as, at the top of the screen we have a description. Then at the bottom of the screen we have the first video which introduces the course. On the left side, it's probably too small, but still on the left side, we have eight modules. And that reminds me that I forgot to mention that this program is designed specifically for very busy students, mostly professionals who work and they want either to receive another degree or it's their mid-age mid, uh, mid career and they want to change that. We get a very, very broad, uh, broad uh, uh, population of students with very different backgrounds, but we still want to make sure that it works best for all students, whether they have time or don't have time. In general, most students who come to us, they take two classes per semester. Um, and the way it works, students uh, focus very hard on one course only. They complete a course in eight weeks, and then they start the second course after that. So during each semester, they complete eight, they complete two courses, eight weeks each. Now, some students uh, might consider taking more courses, but uh, we don't recommend that because usually graduate courses are quite intense. Um, and uh, what, and again, what we offer is based on research, on, uh, on statistics that we receive and collect every year about uh, similar problems, programs about similar uh, graduate programs and other institutions. And we try to make sure that we offer students uh, the best options that are proven to work effectively for, for students. So we have eight modules on the left side. Every week, students complete one module. Uh, they meet with professors. In addition to office hours for GTAs and professors, many of our professors also offer what's called optional class meetings. 
uh, and, uh, and, and, and since not everyone can attend those meetings, they're optional again, nobody's required to appear there, but these class meetings are recorded so that students could watch them later if they have any questions, which uh, I personally do this all the time, and I, I receive feedback from students saying, oh, that was really helpful because I had a few questions, so, and so forth. So, uh, and uh, again, if we, if you would like to, I can go into that uh, further, and then if we have time at the end, I can show, just go through a, a course and show you how it looks. And the next slide, please. All right, so this is the admissions process. Well, Heather, would like to speak about it a little bit? Sure, yeah. So um, basically, the, the application for this program is all online and everything is self-contained within the application portal. So um, there are some requirements that you have to have in order to apply. Um, you need to have a bachelor's degree, um, typically with a GPA of at least 3.0. Um, Dr. Rita Kova, do you have any additional um, information about the prerequisites that you'd like to share about that before I move on? Uh, I'd like to say a few words, but if you continue, then I will edit sure. the Okay, great. All right. Um, and so you um, also, there's a section for your educational, your work experience there. Um, you can also upload your unofficial transcripts through the application portal. And then later on in the application process, there's a separate process for requesting official transcripts as well. Um, you'll submit your resume through the application portal too, and your personal statement. Um, we also require two professional letters of recommendation, um, although with our application system, it's actually a questionnaire format. So um, you enter the recommender's information and then that gets sent to them. They can fill out the questionnaire. So it's a quick process. They um, Correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Ritikova, but for this program, they don't need an official letter of recommendation. Is that right? It is correct. Okay, so it's just a questionnaire format that they fill out. Um, it should still be professional though, so please make sure that if you are applying, you are including professional references, um, but it should only take your recommenders about 10 to 15 minutes to complete that as opposed to having to write a full letter. Um, Dr. Ritikova, did you have additional information about any of this that you wanted to share? I do, but there is one question in the chat window. Do you mind looking at it? Oh, sure, yes. Um, so there is a question here um, about the questionnaire. So how long should they expect the questionnaire to be? Um, so it's just a series of a few questions. Typically, it only takes recommenders about 10 to 15 minutes to complete that recommendation. That's what I've heard from feedback from um, folks anyway. Um, if that if you want more clarification about that please um ask in the chat and i'll be happy to address it um dr ritikova did you have anything else to add about that or anything else about the application process yes thank you another common question i get students say and i am I'm, I'm always very happy to answer it students say what if i don't have um a strong background in it or what if i completed my bachelor degree 20 30 years ago, 50 years ago, uh, what, what should I do? Can I still apply? Yes, the answer is yes. And I'm happy to say that because we are very focused. We, that's the main, one of the differences between us and the CS computer science department. I often, often also get this question because the CS department is more focused on uh, theoretical concepts. Um, they require very strong fundamentals in computer science and math. Um, we are a, de a department where you apply knowledge. We also cover fundamentals. We also cover, cover the theory, but our main focus is to teach students how to apply it. That's why our students, uh, our program is designed to support students with a very different background. Uh, we design courses in a way that helps students to learn, even if they're not experts on IT, because we feel that's what we need to do. We help them become experts in IT. Uh, and, but if a student student or a prospective applicant doesn't have uh, a lot of IT background or there is no re uh, relevant work experience in IT, then the student will be accepted provisionally. What it means that the student will need to take one course, uh, a prep course, in addition to 10 courses that they need to complete. Um, and uh, usually this, this course, it prepares, literally just prepares students for, for further studies. Um, all students who are admitted to our program, they, those who were admitted provisionally, they are quite grateful because they say that they really wanted to get into this program, but they worried that they won't be able to succeed. But with this prep course, they, they felt very comfortable and they would complete the program quite well. So um, if you are one of those students who, if you're not sure about that, 
there is no need to worry. We are working on that with our students and we help them get through the program easily. Um, another question that I get from students a lot is specifically about how much programming ex experience they need um, to start the program. Um, because if I'm not, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe um, Java and Python are the, the programming languages that are used a lot in this program. So students typically ask if they need to have extensive knowledge about that um, when applying or not. Um, and I know you just touched on some of the support that students can get in the program if they don't have as much of an IT background. But I just wanted to know if you had any other things to say specifically about that, about the programming language experience, because that is a question I get a lot from students. It is a very common question. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, no, the answer is we do not require any extensive background in, in uh, programming. If you do have it, that's wonderful. But if not, there are two options. Number one, again, you, can, you might be admitted to the program uh, provisionally, and you will get this prep course, which basically prepares you, gives you fundamentals for programming. But sometimes I see that students in the next course uh, that students are supposed to take uh, that's uh, uh, also on advanced programming but uh, sometimes students um, are if they're admitted to, if they are not admitted provisionally to the program and they start taking this uh, well it's not advanced very advanced but still it's uh, it is used that students uh, already have some knowledge of programming uh, but if students start that course and they feel that it's not really going that well they can easily move to that prep course uh, uh, and we allow students to take a prep course just to help them out to get through the program. So that uh, that is not a big concern for me, but what I always answer students who ask me if they can prepare for that, just to make your life a little bit easier when you go through the program, it might be a good idea to take a course or two online courses, uh, open and open moods or anything that you can find. You don't have to pay for that. But any course on uh, on programming, introductory programming would be fine. You just need to get that feeling about programming, whether you like it or not. Uh, and that also helps a lot to decide whether this is the right program for you. If you take a couple of courses, programming courses, and you feel that it just doesn't work for you, then you might reconsider applying to this program. In IT, even though it's not, again, computer science, where programming is the number one skill, in IT, it's not maybe a, a critical. You, you don't have to be an expert in programming, but you have to be able to program. That's the code. That's, that's part of this program. I hope I answered that question. Yes, you did. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, was there anything else you wanted to add about the admissions process before we move on to the next slide? Uh, no, and not about the admissions process, but I wanted to say something else. Uh, oh, go well, ahead. It's, uh, yes, it's the end of this uh, presentation, but uh, what I also just because it's not part of this specifically, but I still want to mention this. Uh, I'm uh, also quite proud of our faculty. Um, it's, it's, it, I don't know if, if you have that feeling, but we all went, I'm sure, when you go through school, when you go through college, and once in a while, you get to a class and you think, oh, I wish that professor could teach all the classes that I have to take. It's such a great feeling when you connect to someone and, the, and, and it works for you. You're really excited. I just finished my spring classes. I received a few emails from students saying, professor, your class actually class changed changed my, my goals, changed what I want to do in the future. And now I, I see myself in, in this field and I'm so excited about that. That's the kind of uh, the kind of feedback I would like to hear from students about all our classes. That's why I'm proud to say I will repeat this one more time because I'm very proud of this. Uh, several faculty in our department receive out, received outstanding teaching awards. And just to give you an idea about that, uh, we have uh, over 2,000 professors in the institute um, and there is one award, uh, teaching award in each category. So that's so our professors are that good. Um, and this, they have lots of experience. What's also important uh, that they are not uh, only great professors who teach very well because they have also uh, uh, background and experience in innovative teaching and learning. But in addition to that, they are great experts in their, their field of knowledge. Um, cybersecurity, intelligence methods, data analytics, data science, machine learning, natural language processing. Uh, we are, for instance, uh, affiliate, well, uh, they are affiliated with our department, but we have a great center on cybersecurity, which is probably one of the 
uh, most uh, uh, most successful research center. Well, it's actually the most successful research centers uh, on cybersecurity in in Mason. Uh, and faculty who work there at that, at that research center who does uh, revolutionary research projects, they, they also work for us. They work in our departments. They, they're faculty members in our department. So faculty who teach these classes, they are also great experts in IT fields. And they bring their knowledge, their expertise back to the classroom. We also have a lot of uh, 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 professors who have a very extensive industry experience because they have experience both in academia and in industry that even 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 more exciting when i see that because these faculty they bring the, their industry knowledge not only uh, academic background but industry knowledge to the classrooms we make sure that students stay connected uh, not only with professors but with uh, with industry whether it's possible or not but we try to do that uh, and overall uh, the type of environment we create for our students, it's very collaborative, it's very supportive from every angle, from professors, from the department, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the admissions office, from the graduate office, uh, and uh, from, the, uh, from the advisor side also. Uh, overall, uh, students are quite satisfied with their experience, and every year we go through accreditation. We just went through a huge accreditation, actually, which went marvelously. We received outstanding results. Uh, and, uh, and the report was just spot on. They said that we did everything we could uh, to build a great program, which was very nice to hear. Um, and I hope that once you, um, uh, well, check out the programs, because I always recommend students to look around to see if there's anything else that they might be interested in, then please feel free to contact us, uh, Mason, the admissions team, the, the this department itself and myself, and we'll be happy to answer your questions about the program. Oh, hey, there is a question. Yes, there's a couple questions coming in. Um, I have yeah. one question in the Q&A and one in the chat right now. Um, so in the chat, it says roughly how many professors are teaching for the cybersecurity concentration? Um, and they're asking this because they know that cybersecurity is a new track for GMU. Thank you. Um, I have to very politely uh, disagree with this statement because cyber, okay. we are experts on cybersecurity. We've been doing cybersecurity for over 10 years. So we, it's not new for us at all. Cybersecurity was the first concentration we developed and it exists for as long as I remember, 10 years. Um, and uh, roughly again, you can check our department and then it will take you to, to the cybersecurity center, the research center I was talking about. Um, you will see how many faculty are involved. I would say that currently we have at least five, six uh, uh, professors who are uh, senior professors who work in the cybersecurity field. And we also have junior faculty whose uh, expertise is uh, in the intersection of cybersecurity, for instance, and big data, cybersecurity and data analytics and so forth. Uh, that's a great question, by the way. I'm always happy to answer such questions because I can talk more about our faculty. That makes me feel very good. Thank you for asking, Nick. Yeah, um, I have another question too that came in through the Q&A. Um, it says, from the employer side of things, how would you differentiate a candidate that has a master's in data analytics engineering versus the MS in applied IT with a concentration in data analytics and intelligence methods? Um, do you think that's something that an employer would take into account? Um, this person who's asking this question is split between choosing between the two Mason programs. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a tough one. I know that uh, students, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the students said an uh, open house for the data analytics engineering program yesterday. I hope that uh, students were able to attend that presentation too. Um, what I recommend to do is to look at the list of courses. Uh, uh, it's uh, I, I I cannot speak for for employers because at each employer will look for a specific. Uh, specific skills that a student, uh, that the person needs to have when they hire someone. I would look at this list of courses. I would decide uh, which pack, which path would be more applicable to me. Um, in the data analytics engineering program, math requirements are higher. That's for sure. So you will have to be a little bit more uh, better prepared in math. Um, uh, but uh, I would, other than this, I I I. I it's hard to say if there is a huge difference between two programs, 
what we do better, uh, not better, but what we what we offer, uh, we have higher level courses. So we kind of data analytics engineering. It's an interdisciplinary program which is developed uh, by multiple departments. We also participate in that program. We have one concentration offered in that program. So once you apply there, you might actually end up in our own concentration. But uh, but uh, but if you look at the list of courses that they have to offer, and if I'm not mistaken then for the data analytics engineering program there are 10 courses also and six of those courses are our AIT courses uh, which means that if you go there then you will have very similar background once you uh, graduate but what we do in our department we don't just give um, introductory and medium uh, mi middle level courses uh, in each concentration we go further and we offer higher level courses they're usually called 700 level courses Okay, thank you so much for clarifying all of that. Um, and we have another question coming in. It says, what are the electives and core subjects for the MS in cybersecurity? Um, can I additionally take courses in machine learning for physical security? In parentheses, they put machine grid security, et cetera. Yes. Uh, well, not yes, but <laughs> okay. what I'm trying to say is that, uh, so there, if we go back to one of the previous slides, there is a list of courses there in the cybersecurity concentration. Uh, on the left side, we have six courses. But um, if you if you look at the um, uh, at the machine learning, con learning engineering concentration, they're quite different from the cybersecurity concentration. And what uh, I usually... Uh, recommend students to do is to consider two options. Number one, you can take one concentration, and then in addition, you can complete more courses. But you don't you don't need it for your for your degree because you only need ten courses. But you cannot substitute the, these. The concentrations were developed very closely uh, with the standards for each of these fields. Standards provided by. Uh, by the professional organizations in uh, in IT and so forth. Um, so we we tried we we wanted to make sure the students by the time they graduate after completing one concentration they become experts in this field. If students try to mix courses from different concentrations, then at the end it might be um, we're not sure that we will be able to deliver high quality experience for students and build great foundation in this selected field. Um, again, it might be okay for some programs, but our goal is to guide the students through a particular uh, concentration they chose. So I hope I, okay, good, good. I answered this question. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. Um, on the topic of concentrations, are students able to switch concentrations once they choose one in the program? Yes, of course. Uh, what I recommend to do, not to delay too much, I always, I always worry about this. This is my scariest uh, thought when I think about new students. And our advisors are very good about that. What we, uh, for instance, uh, we just accepted lots of students in the fall, new students. And uh, what we've done, we went back and we double checked because students come from different places and there are different ways they get into the department. It, it, all the details are not important to you. But to us, it's important. So when, you, when we admit students, we go back. We check if everything is met, if they have all the concentrations selected, if they're on the right path. Uh, and uh, just recently, in the last three weeks, we contacted students uh, three times every week to make sure that students have their concentration selected. So we discovered that a few students kind of missed that. We also contacted students in the program once we realized that, oh, wait a second, maybe some students are still confused. So we contacted students in the entire program. We asked them to, uh, to, to double check if they have a concentration. We, we provided some help if they're not sure about which concentration to choose. Just remember that um, undergraduate and graduate studies are very different. Graduate studies, you start today and then psh, no time and you're done. It's only two years, but many students finish earlier. You can even finish this program in one year. It's a lot of work. But it's it's doable because you can uh, complete multiple courses, four courses per semester. We also offer classes in summer, and I and I've seen students who would do again too much in my opinion, but 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 they would complete uh, multiple courses each semester and they would finish earlier than two years. Um, so it's doable, but we we recommend to make sure that you select your concentration from the very beginning. 
you have maybe one semester at most to make a decision to change the concentration. But again, nevertheless, you can change it later, but then you might end up with extra courses, which you don't want to. You want to have only 10 courses that you need. You don't want to um, waste your time. If, and, yeah. Okay, is there a definite time that students need to choose their concentration within the program? Um, like, is there a, a definite time that they can't switch again after that or that they have to choose a concentration by? There is no such date, but students are asked to select the concentration when they apply. And we do this on purpose, even though we understand students sometimes don't know much about it yet. But still, uh, I really like it when students do some homework. You can look around, you can read about each path. You can think more about what you want to do or look at some jobs, look at some again, salaries, um, even though all salaries would be good in these fields. But then once you're applied, you can still talk to, you can still change that. And, and there is, you can change it even in the last year, but you will need to take new courses all over again to get that concentration. But, but, but still, it's not an issue. I've never heard any concerns about that from students. So that part is easier. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have another question also on the topic of concentrations. Um, which concentration would you recommend for someone who has a focus wanting to jump into reverse engineering? Well, um, what I would what I what I would do probably machine learning engineering is great, data analytics is great too. But all these fields they're applicable in pretty much any IT field today. This education is very broad in a sense; it's very focused but broad. It covers different areas, and you will be apply you will be able to apply this knowledge to different fields. Um, what I would suggest to do is to look at the description again of what of job tasks that you are interested in, and then check the courses that we have to offer to see if there is a match. Okay, thank you. Um, and I have another question coming in here. Um, someone is asking how many credits that a student can take during a semester. I know you mentioned earlier um, really encouraging students to not take more than one class at a time, um, but how many credits are students allowed to take during a semester? Well, <laughs> well, um, well, so usually it's two courses. Um, you can try and take more, three, four courses. That's what I was talking about earlier, that if you are, if you don't have a job, if you don't have a family, if you don't have children, <laughs> If, um, if all you do, you, you want to just to focus on study, then you can still take more than two courses. But in my experience, that's, that's not really, a, um, it, it, is it, it is challenging. So there is no limit per se. Well, I mean, there is a limit, but, but it's up to you, but it's, it could be challenging. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and just to clarify, for this program, each course is three credits, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so typically um, students would be taking six credits during a semester if they're taking two classes a semester. It is Sorry. correct. If you think okay. about this, I don't know if we want to go into details, but if you think about it for a second, um, if uh, you're taking a course, which is a three credit course, then, um, and I'm not giving any secrets, the way it's, that's a standard, standard, um, uh, standard requ not requirement, but standard definition. Here we go. That's a standard definition for a free credit course. You can check it online. It means that a, a student spends three hours in the classroom. Here is everything online. So it's not really directly applicable, but stay with me. It's three hours in the classroom. And for a three hour class, it's twice that amount for homework uh, for study at home, which gives you six hours. So basically a graduate course, which is a free credit course, gives you nine hours per week to study. Um, and that's, that's, that's the amount of time that you will have to put into this. But uh, what we do during these eight weeks, we run these classes on this uh, uh, compressed schedule Usually in universities, classes run uh, during 15 weeks. This course is uh, packed into eight weeks because it's designed for working professionals. So that means that you are taking, taking 
kind of twice the amount of, you need to complete twice the amount of work than you would do if you would take it during the entire semester, which gives us, an, for nine hours, it gives us 18 hours. So if you're taking four courses per, per one semester in this program or any other graduate program, it will be 36 hours uh, to work uh, for this program. So again, that's like full-time job. Yeah, that definitely um, makes a lot of sense why we'd encourage students to only take one course at a time in the program. Um, in terms of the coursework, um, can you give some more information about what students can expect in terms of what type of assignments they are going to do in the program? Is it a lot of group projects? Is it pa papers? Is it a mixture of different kinds of assignments? Oh, it's probably one of my favorite questions. When I hear that, all I want to do is to talk about courses because we are, uh, many of us, we are very enthusiastic teachers and we, we put so much effort into each course that we develop. And these courses and this program, again, if you decide to come, you will not be disappointed. I guarantee this to you. But uh, we try to mix. Again, we base everything we do on research, on, uh, on educational research. And uh, we make sure that we address all the recommendations that we follow those guidelines to create the best uh, uh, experience for students, even though it's online. And I know it's more difficult to create an engaging environment here, but still it's possible. So what we will give you just a few examples is from my course, but, uh, but other courses are very consistent with what I do. Well, I make sure that students have opportunities to complete different types of assignments. That's important from the educational perspective, because if I only give uh, one midterm exam and one final exam, then it's, uh, it's uh, well, that, that is a set to fail students. So that's not what we do. In graduate programs in general, we want students to succeed really very much. In, in majority of, uh, of, well, in most of the students in graduate classes, they receive uh, very high grades. It's either A or B. Because if you get a C, then you cannot get really a lot of Cs because you will not be able to graduate. So in general, uh, in graduate programs, student graduate classes, students are very, very, very much supported by professors. We really try to make this experience uh, not only valuable, but also interesting for students. So going back to assignments now, um, uh, and that's why I have different types of assignments with different weights, because sometimes students say, oh, I cannot really do this because it's too much, but I can do this and that and I can succeed here and there. And overall, uh, when students complete the course, then with these multiple types of assignments, they really build a very, very comprehensive knowledge of the field of, field of study. For instance, I have uh, quizzes, which are not quizzes as you know them. Uh, in my class and many other classes we do, that's something that actually we, we discovered with my colleagues. But in our classes, we use quizzes as learning tools, not testing tools. Uh, what it means that the students take this, these quizzes, but they can take them as many times as they want to. They see results, they can uh, answers, they can retake them until they're satisfied with the grade. We use the same test banks for exams. So students by taking these quizzes, not only learn the material, but they're also preparing for exams, which students absolutely love. They say like, it's like a game. So you press a button, you read that, and automatically uh, you learn the material. Uh, we showed it at the conference even that by using quizzes in this mode, students improve their grades on terminology by one letter grade, which is very significant in our days. We all don't remember things very well. We have to because we can get answers uh, like, like that. But this helps tremendously to memorize terminology, to help students with key concepts and to learn the material. Um, I have practice problems which are assigned to students to work together, to work on together. Uh, I ask students to post their solutions on the discussion board to provide feedback to other students, to incorporate feedback into, into their solutions. Now, I have what's called, uh, I call it a baby research paper. I don't know if many of you heard about chat GPT. Could you please put it in the, in the chat window, yes or no? I'm just curious. Chat GPT. Did anybody hear about chat GPT? Yep, okay, yes. so I'm, <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that. I hope other students are still with us, but that's a great tool. And uh, just recently in the last two months or so, all the, everyone in academia, it's a, that's a new, um, a, a new disruptive technology. Now we don't know what to do because chat GPT uh, it's an AI tool that is capable of uh, doing quite quite a lot. 
It can write papers, it can write code, it can program for you. And the first impression was kind of quite, quite scary because if students not so, but anyone, if anyone can use that, then how do we teach students? What do we do? Uh, what, what I decided to do right now, and I'm teaching this class I started last week, I incorporated ChatGPT. I asked students to use it for a baby research paper I have. It's like only two, four pages uh, on databases. And students uh, learned this tool. They already got some feedback to me. They said, wow, that's really interesting. It could be so useful to, to learn better from that. So uh, I have little baby research paper, a baby research paper for students to see how we can incorporate research activities into not, not just this course, but into our everyday life. Because if you think about research, uh, even if you buy a car, if you buy a house, you have to do research. You need to know how to search data, how to interpret data, how to understand that. So research really helps students. That's based on, again, lots of studies and reports that we get from industry that they expect students to have the skills that are required by doing research, but not much. Again, it's a very, very small, just a tiny, tiny bit small percentage of that. I also have uh, so-called homework assignments, whereas is, these assignments are completed by students individually, but they can also get help from their uh, classmates. They can discuss the and assignments are individual so that they're different. So the students could, uh, could try on their own how it works. Um, and of course, again, discussion boards where students can discuss anything, any questions they have. Uh, we also include projects. Uh, it depends on the particular class. You might have a final exam, you might have a project, and it depends on the particular course, which kind of assignments you will get. The way it works again, uh, overall, the goal for our classes, uh, and I'm sure all graduate programs are pretty much the same, is to set uh, students for success. Everything we provide, all the assignments, all the reading materials, all these participate collaborative activities, it all helps students to get better in their classes, to get as much learning as possible, and to find it to be enjoyable, because that's what we, uh, we care about a lot. Thank you. Great question. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. So um, we have one more question um, in the Q&A. Um, it says, during the summer months, are most of the courses and electives available, or are most of the courses only available in the fall and spring semesters? And I'm so happy to answer this question. I am proud of our, of our department because we schedule all classes in summer. All. You don't have probably access to our scheduling system because there are no students yet. But if you look at that, then we offer literally all classes in summer because we don't want students to stop uh, in the middle uh, students can take one course students can take two courses um, students uh, it's still that's 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 some work because in summer people are uh, well it's the summertime vacation time it might be a bit challenging for students to stay in uh, in the classroom but I'm teaching right now a summer class uh, students are very engaged uh, I just uh, finished uh, a meeting with them uh, a couple of hours ago. So we discussed lots of ideas that we can implement in this course. So that's, uh, that's a great, great way to work with students and professors in these online classes. I enjoy it very much. So yes, we, we have all the classes. Okay, that's great to hear. I'm glad that we offer all of those um, all throughout the year. Um, so we do have a couple more minutes. Um, so if anybody has any last minute questions, um, please feel free to put those in the chat or put those in the Q&A. Um, but in the meantime, I did want to point out um, the contact information for admissions. If you are interested in applying to the program, um, you can give us a call at 703-348-5006. Um, we'll be available tomorrow if you want to call in. Um, there's also the email address you can reach out to us at online2 at gmu.edu. And if you have any other additional questions that um, you didn't get to ask this evening, please feel free to reach out to us about that there as well. Um, and then the website here here um, is masononline.gmu.edu if you'd like to visit that website for more information about the program. Um, thank you for joining everybody tonight. I was very happy to have um, this virtual open house with you all. And thank you to Dr. Rudikova for joining us and for providing us with all of this very helpful information. Um, but if I 
we're going to log out in just a moment, but folks are saying thank you as well in the chat. Um, thank you so much for attending. If anybody has any last minute questions, um, please feel free to put those in right now. We have about one minute left of time. Dr. Rita Kova, did you have anything else to add before we end our meeting here tonight? All I can say is that, well, thank you for coming, number one. But more importantly, I'd like to um, wish you all the best in your future uh, future decisions. Whether you decide to come to us or to another program, would love to see everyone in our program. But I only wish you success. I hope that you will find the right program for yourself. You will enjoy it. You will go through it. And you will be. I'm sure you will be very successful in your future career. Good luck, everyone.